Well, thank you very much to Cyber Salon for inviting me uh, and allowing me to be here. Um, I think that I should tell you I'm cutting down a 45-minute presentation to 10 minutes. So wherever possible, listen to what I say rather than look at the slides, because I have far too much information on my slides. If you want to catch up with anything that I've said, you can find longer versions of two talks I gave uh, at SIGINT in Cologne and on YouTube, and also um, one for ORG, uh, Open Rights Group, in June. So I suppose, given the current news, one interesting thing to explore would be under what legal authority did the Americans wiretap Angela Merkel's phone? I mean, she's not a terrorist. So exactly how was that authorised? And I hope to shed some light on that in this talk. But first of all, can I just ask, who here uses American-based web services? Microsoft, Google, Facebook, any of that? Okay. Who here uses solely European-based services, where you're sure that that data does not leave Europe and does not go to the US? Okay. So, for those people who use American-based services, you know that there is this European Data Protection Directive from 1995, and you probably also know it's being replaced right now with a new European regulation. So, how many people think that either the current directive or the new regulation will actually protect you from any of this NSA stuff? Good. Well, you're right. It won't. And I want to try and explain why. So what this talk is really about is a fundamental asymmetry between the situation in the US and the situation in Europe. And I have huge, huge admiration for what The Guardian has done in their coverage uh, of Edward Snowden's revelations with two reservations. <laughs> and I don't think they've done a good job of explaining two points, which I, I want to bring out. So let's press on. Um, first of all, some preliminaries about myself. Uh, as some of you know in the introduction, um, for nine years I was chief privacy advisor to Microsoft uh, for 40 countries. Now, explaining exactly what I did would take too long, but I want to make one point, which is I didn't have any responsibility for legal compliance. Thank God. That was not my job, um, and I'm very glad it wasn't my job. Uh, I've actually been warning about the law underlying PRISM since 2011, when I left Microsoft and made about 25 speeches, uh, most of them before Edward Snowden. Um, and in fact, I offered both The Guardian and the BBC, if you like, an anticipation of Snowden back in January. And The Guardian wouldn't touch it, and neither would the BBC. Three journalists of The Guardian wouldn't touch it. Um, I don't trust Microsoft. Uh, that's not really because of anything that's happened since then. I never really did trust Microsoft. Uh, I was always kind of um, uh, a grit in the oyster. There. And I'm not going to talk about why I left Microsoft today. <laughs> <coughs> so what this talk is really about is cloud computing. Cloud computing is often dismissed as, a, as hype, as an industry buzzword. No different from what we've done for a long time with things like Hotmail. Actually, that's not true. Cloud computing is much, much more than simply a remote disk drive. The real significance of cloud computing is parallel processing power at a distance sold as a commodity. And if there's one thing that I'd like to take away from this talk, it's that you should understand anytime you use Facebook or Gmail or any web-based service, it's running on cloud computing infrastructure. It's running on cloud computing software. It's your data in somebody else's CPU. Now, the significance of this is basically encryption is futile against the NSA. And my talk will try and explain why. You can encrypt stuff person to person with GPG or PGP. As far as we know, that still works. But if you use an American-based cloud service, encryption will not help you. And this is going to try and explain why. We have to say something, first of all, right back uh, in the previous decade about the so-called warrantless wiretapping affair. I can't give you the complete um, story of this, but essentially what emerged from this was via a whistleblower from, uh, who was an AT&T technician. It was discovered around about 2003, but it was actually not published until 2005, that in AT&T's main San Francisco switching center, they were splitting one of the main fiber optic cables for the western seaboard 
triaging that data with a top of the range DPI box and sending some part of that, we don't know what exactly yet still, back to the NSA. And that this probably wasn't just happening in one switching center, it was happening all over the US. And this was widely reported for between 2005 and 2007 in the United States. It's a strange fact that when the rest of the world's press was reporting this scandal, they reported it entirely as if this was some parochial affair about Americans evading, invading Americans' privacy. There was no reporting of the fact that this surveillance was obviously directed at us, at the rest of the world. It was not primarily ever about surveillance of Americans. It's about surveillance of the rest of the world. But somehow, until very recently, the world's press does not seem able to have been able to understand that. So, first of all, we have to talk about some US law that's the entire problem here. And the basic term of art is foreign intelligence information. And this, in fact, goes back to the first FISA law, the first Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Act of 1978, which was passed in the wake of the Watergate scandal, when it was discovered that the CIA and the NSA were actually doing large-scale spying on Americans. So they passed this law. And this law, um, well, a couple of different aspects, but one aspect is this definition here. So it's a complex definition. It includes the things that you would expect, like money laundering, terrorism, and weapons of mass destruction. But it also includes these two limbs, which actually have never been talked about since 1978. You can scour the legal literature, the policy literature, everywhere. Nobody has ever discussed what this means. But if you unwind two levels of definition, you get this. Information with respect to a foreign-based political organization or foreign territory that relates to the conduct of the foreign affairs of the United States. So that can be just about anything. <laughs> and indeed, a foreign political organization doesn't have to be a political party. It can be an activist group, a civil society campaigning group, anybody, frankly, that takes issue with some aspect of American foreign policy meets that definition. Up here. So that's probably the law that authorised tapping of Angela Merkel's phone. I mean, that's my best guess. Uh, that's the part of the definition that would be relevant. And interestingly, Feinstein, Senator Feinstein, as James mentioned, has said just in the last 24 hours that this authorisation for Merkel's phone dates back 10 years, nothing they ever knew about, nobody told them. Well, this is what it's all about. So, sorry. the law that it turns out underlies prison is a law that was passed in 2008. It was actually an amendment to the first Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Act, FISA, of 1978. But this 2008 law was new, and it combined three elements for the first time, which had been there previously, but they came together for the first time in this law. The first aspect is that this law only targets non-Americans outside the US. I say only, but that's of course 95% of the population of the planet. <laughs> Secondly, and nobody noticed this at the time, it snuck in remote computing services. Now, the definition of remote computing services in fact equates to what we would call cloud computing today. All previous of these laws, of the examples of these laws, had dealt with communications, sending a message from A to B. Well, that's one kind of way of uh, serving a Russian famous law, but the other way is to get at the data. And that's what the FISA law does. It gets at any data which meets this definition of foreign intelligence information. And then in 2008, they snuck in this extra category, which meant, for the first time, it applied to data at rest, sitting on a server at Microsoft, <coughs> where you would have sent it for remote processing. And thirdly, there's this aspect that there is this purely political definition of foreign intelligence information. Nothing to do with terrorism, nothing to do with national security as such, uh, nothing to do with things that we would recognize as criminal. Purely political spying. Uh, but that was there since 1978. But it was only this law that brought all of these things together. So you could say that this law, in some sense, was designed for mass surveillance of cloud computing. It also means that there is this, what I call a double discrimination by US nationality. Now, not only is this 2008 law, which underlies PRISM, only targeting 
non-Americans outside the US, the very definition of foreign intelligence information in fact also contains a discrimination. Because if you were a US citizen, this relates would be necessary. Necessary, a very high legal threshold, relates just about the lowest you can get. So that's what I mean by double discrimination by nationality. And this is completely at odds with the European conception of human rights. The European conception of human rights, indeed the United Nations conception of human rights, is that human rights are universal, including the right to privacy. And if the state is justified in infringing somebody's privacy for surveillance, the justification has to be objective. It has to be about what that person is suspected of doing, or the risk, the damage that they could cause. It cannot be somehow reduced to nationality. And that is one of the points that I don't think The Guardian has done a terribly good job of explaining to its readers. In fact, even though both Naomi Wolf and Greg Greenwald wrote columns about Pfizer before Snowden in The Guardian uh, last year, a, a, a casual reader, indeed a scrupulous reader, would not have any idea that this law was in fact aimed at the rest of the world, rather than looking at this as some parochial argument about the NSA spying on Americans. So, we also have to talk a bit about the famous Fourth Amendment to the US Constitution. This is the amendment that was passed very early after the American Revolution, almost out of resentment from the British use of so-called general warrants. A general warrant would basically allow uh, a British red coat to trample down the door of any American proto-revolutionary and maybe seize some rum they were smuggling. Um, so the Americans really didn't like this, and they put into their constitution that there had to be a particular warrant specifying, uh, in particular, the, the persons and things to be, uh, to be searched. So there's a long story here which I can't explain, but strange but true, it really only emerged last year that this Fourth Amendment protection did not apply at all to anybody whose data was sent to the American. So if you're not physically located legally as a person in America, you have no rights, no privacy rights at all under Pfizer. So I've got a little video clip I'm going to play, which is actually when in, uh, in the US Congress they were considering the renewal of this law, uh, about July last year. And the clip you're going to see is actually uh, of one of the leading civil liberties advocates, Jamil Jaffa of ACLU, being sort of interrogated rather aggressively by a Texas congressman about this very point. Does the Fourth Amendment offer any protection to people outside America? It's Microsoft, right? <laughs> I use Microsoft free software now, so I'm afraid you have to blame that. <laughs> This is your IP real song. Does the Fourth Amendment apply to foreign targets in foreign lands? I don't think that's the question. No, 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 that's my question. So, I said, oh, I can promise you it's the right question because that's my question. <laughs> <laughs> Does it apply? Congress is having a good laugh at our expense. They're making fun of the, of the idea that... <laughs> Hello? Okay. They're making fun 
of the idea. Do we have a microphone? Okay. They're making fun of the idea that you and I have privacy rights under American law. Now, if that equivalent conversation was taking place in Europe, there would be no discussion. Americans' data and Americans enjoy the full protection of data protection in Europe and the European Convention of Human Rights. The problem is that when we send our data to America, we have no rights. That's the problem. So, um, through some good fortune, um, I wrote a report about this last year, uh, which got a little bit of publicity around uh, January and February. Unfortunately, the government <coughs> didn't want to cover it. But um, what's really going on here in terms of data protection is a country trick. Under the plan that was running on Rails for European data protection, what would have happened in the future is that Microsoft or Google or Facebook, they would have achieved a sort of blanket certification for their platform. European data protection authorities would have to accept that. And questions of mass surveillance by the NSA would disappear in a puff of audit. It's a sort of legal country trick. Um, and I guess one thing which is interesting is when I wrote, wrote the report last year, I referred and described the structure of the Pfizer law and so on and so forth, uh, but I knew that there existed um, two sets of documents, so-called minimization procedures and targeting procedures under Pfizer, which I never expected to see. But then, of course, with Edward Snowden, the Guardian promptly published them. And when you go through them and you sort of sweep aside the bureaucratic jargon, you find, indeed, there is absolutely no protection provided for non-Americans. So this is a fairly dramatic com confirmation, in a sense, of the hypothesis last year. And European data protection authorities did nothing. I've been warning the European Commission about this. I've been warning European data protection authorities about this, initially in private and then publicly and making speeches about this. None of European officialdom have done a damn thing about this. They've all said it's not our problem at the European level to defend Europeans' data from the predations of foreign intelligence agencies. People should understand that. The European level of governance is not intending to protect you from this sort of spying. And therefore we have to ask, is our government intending to protect us from this sort of spying? Um, there's some more details I could put in, but I think... Yes, let's take questions, because I'm sure people have questions. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it's just about the end of the presentation. I hope so.